Is James <clears throat> better? I don't know. That's up to James. You know, the, the key is that uh, I, I'm so grateful to James. Okay? Uh, James asked a question, and basically I answered it. Did you guys all read everything yeah, that yeah, I put yeah. in there? Okay? So, you know, the, the first thing is that everybody understands that being attacked is part of being the Buddha. You understand that, right? Mm -hmm. Any, if you're not being attacked, then you really aren't going there because how is it that we know it's the correct teaching? Being attacked. Being attacked. Now, as, you know, as the opposite of common sense as that might be, that is the teaching, okay? Because there are a lot of practices and faiths that will have people that will say, oh, it made me so happy or it got me all this good fortune or it got me all this luck. We're not the only ones that get benefits from prayer. Okay? We're the only ones that get obstacles that we are never defeated by, though. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. We bring that out for the sake of proving the validity of the fact that we are practicing the correct teaching because we never lose, even though we're attacked and attacked and attacked. Okay? So do not regret that you don't live a, live a peaceful life. If you live a peaceful life, you're not on the correct path. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense only in light of faith in the teaching. Okay? Anybody else is kind of going to go like, huh? But don't, don't tell them anybody that on the front end of trying to get them to chant. <laughs> okay? But at that point in time, they're not about to become the Buddha, nor would they explain being the Buddha if you, if you even tried to express it to them. Okay? But as you develop in your faith, please never, ever, ever, ever be afraid of obstacles. This is what we do. You know, I'm going to read a couple of Gosho passages to you. And I hope, again, I just don't stop falling. But this is, again, just from the opening eyes. This is just a couple of, just a couple of paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I'm trying not to blow tissue paper all over myself with my powerful. Blowing. Blows. Okay. <laughs> you know, everybody uh, knows this quote. But... A lot of people don't read it past the point of the quotation, the first sentence. Mm -hmm. it, says, it says, although, I, this is from the opening of the eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I posted this this weekend. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just, I just want to reiterate it. Mm -hmm. Although I and my disciples may encounter various difficulties, if we do not harbor doubts in our hearts, we will, mm -hmm. as a matter of course, attain Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just stop there, it sounds like, okay, all I got to do is chant and Everything's going to be great because Buddhahood is great, right? Buddhahood is like right. some utopia kind yeah. of existence or state, correct? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> he, says, he says, do not have doubts mm -hmm. simply because heaven does not lend you protection. Because mm -hmm. it's not that heaven's not lending you protection. You're getting the opportunity to prove the fact that you're the Buddha. Not just to yourself, but to everybody else that's watching. And as I said, they are always watching. Mm -hmm. Do not be discouraged because you do not enjoy an easy and secure existence mm -hmm. in this life. Mm -hmm. That is not part of the gig either. Mm. All right? Yes. This is what I have taught my disciples morning and evening. If you read the Gosha, it's there over and over and over and over and over again. If you're missing it as part of the teaching, then you're just not reading the teaching. That's really the point. That is the case. And he says... This is what I've taught my disciples a morning and evening, and yet they begin to harbor doubts and abandon their faith because they expect the easy road. Mm -hmm. They expect heaven. Heavenly beings is only world number six. We dwell in ten. We're way beyond having to have little sugar-coated crap like heavenly, the realm of heavenly beings. Do you understand? We're way beyond that. Our compassion and mercy makes that look like somebody that has no heart or soul seriously mm -hmm. okay he says foolish men because we, oh, we're, we're filled with good times oh we're so filled with appreciation mm. but the wisdom is when we're filled with challenges to perceive that that's really our benefit yeah. so he says foolish men are likely to forget the promises they have made when the crucial moment comes and the crucial moment is when you're faced with difficulties that you know you've not made the cause to have to experience you're doing everything you're supposed to do. And yet you still meet difficulty. 
You should never be surprised by that. That is your reward. Okay? And then also, always understand that the reason you never have to be afraid is because, as it says in On Prayer, and yet though one might point at the earth and miss it, though one might bind up the sky, though the tides might cease to ebb and flow, and the sun rise in the west, it could never come that the prayers of the practitioner of the Lotus Sutra would go unanswered. If the bodhisattvas, the human and heavenly beings, the eight kinds of non-human beings, the two sages, these are all the people who are at the, at the ceremony, right? Mm. Uh, uh, the two heavenly deities and the ten demon daughters would, by some unlikely chance, fail to appear and protect the practitioner of the Lotus Sutra. Sutra then, above them, they would be uh, showing... Uh, disdain for Shakyamuni and all other Buddhas, and below they would be guilty of deceiving the beings of the nine worlds. And this is the key. It's never about whether you're good enough. You're always good enough. You are the Buddha. This is not about having to achieve a state that you receive this protection. This is automatic based on your faith. Mm -mm. It makes no difference if the practitioner himself is lacking in worth, defective in wisdom, impure in his precepts and lacking in virtue derived from observing the precepts. So long as he chants nam yaho rengekyo, they will invariably protect him. One does not throw away gold because the bag that holds it is dirty. One does not ignore the sandalwood trees because of the foul odor of the aranda trees around them. And one does not refuse to gather lotuses because the pond in the valley where they grow is not clean. If they ignore the practitioner of the Lotus Sutra, they will be going against their vow, and they would never do that. So you don't have to worry about that. Mm. All right? I just wanted, that was for my friend James, and to say thank you to my friend James. Aloha, bro. And Gene, we miss you. We hope you uh, have a wonderful trip, and you know everything works out exactly as you want it to. We're continuing with the Heart of the Lotus Sutra, on page 271, we're making our way right through this. The second, uh, the, the second half of uh, page 271, suffering is necessary to bring out the full flavor of joy. And I didn't realize that was going to tie into exactly what I just said. I, honest to God, didn't even pay any attention to that. So I didn't bring these out to supplement this. This is, again, the spookiness of the Gohonzon. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Give me a moment. <laughs> Suffering is necessary to bring out the full flavor of joy. In any age, ordinary people suffer the most under the weight of society's strains and distortions. None are more miserable than those who follow foolish leaders. Individuals of genuine greatness never forget that the people are the true treasures of society, which was why I was moved to tears a moment ago because I realized that with my whole life. In his preface to La Miserable, Victor Hugo wrote, so long as ignorance and poverty exists on earth, books of the nature of Les Miserables cannot fail to be of use. I want to rid the world of misery. This was President Toda's heartfelt proclamation. He was an unparalleled leader who always advanced together with the people. While lecturing on the passage of the lifespan chapter we are studying, Mr. Toda, with his characteristic humor, once remarked, we have come to this Sahe world to enjoy ourselves, and there's no greater joy than kicking ass on the devil of the sixth heaven. There's no greater joy than overcoming the impossible and, and, and delivering victory to not only yourself but to all the people that you encourage. But without a dash of suffering, there, we couldn't savor the full flavor of joy. The fact is that the world, far from being a place of amusement, is full of suffering. Those listening to him learned that as long as they possessed the highly effective medicine of the of mystic law, they could each cross the raging seas of society and establish, and establish a state of profound calm and composure. How, I'm so sorry. How such broad-minded words, pardon me. Wow. Pardon me. 
How such broad-minded words of a true spiritual leader dispelled the dark clouds of an ease and shed light into the hearts of people living amid the confusion of, post-war, of the post-war era. <coughs> this is the way of a true leader. No matter how exhausted President Tota was, whenever he found members who were suffering or worn out, he poured his entire being into encouraging them. With the same spirit and immense life force, SGI members today embrace those who are struggling or sick or are supposed to. All of you have been taking action with this spirit, or should be. Even with your own pressing concerns, you drive yourselves to try your best to encourage those in dire need. When you, when you hear reports about how people have become happy or gained benefit through faith, it dispels all sense of fatigue. The SGI has created such a network of people helping one another become happy. It is a great castle of happiness created by the hearts of ordinary people. No one can destroy this noble solidarity of the bodhisattvas of the earth. Nietzsche and Daishonin observes that even though people of power can destroy Buddha images or temples, they are powerless to destroy Buddhism itself. And it is impossible for someone's spirit to be destroyed from the outside. That's why, you ask me how he is? He's up to him. It's always up to each of us. As long as we have beautiful unity, the world of the mystic law is absolutely indestructible. We live in a time when the three poisons are particularly strong, and we suffer just as the children in the parable suffered from the poison they drank. Everybody remembers last week, yes. right? The deadlock of the present age is due to people having forgotten their inner revolution. This is the lesson of the 20th century. What does he mean by that? This deadlock of the present age is due to people having forgotten their inner revolution. Anybody? This is the prevalent reality that we accept the lives that we're given without trying to perfect them. Okay? We don't give ourselves credit for having the power within to become completely revolutionized, completely different, naturally, and without any other influence than bringing out the 10th world that already exists in our life. Okay? If we're not trying to bring out the 10th world in our life, mm -hmm. it will not appear. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why he says the deadlock of the present age is due to people having forgotten their inner revolution. Mm -hmm. This is the lesson of the 20th century. In every field, people search for a philosophy to remove the poisons in their hearts. Mm. All humankind thirsts for the highly effective medicine of the mystic law. Nietzsche says that followers who practice the mystic law are the original possessors of this highly effective medicine. Our compassionate practice to relieve others of suffering and give them joy will doubtless spearhead the revival of the heart and the revival of the humanism of the 21st century. And what is our compassionate practice to relieve others? The fact that as Buddhas, we return to the Sahe world mm. to experience the same suffering as them and to be living examples of the way out of it. Okay? Which means suffering is necessary to bring out the full flavor of joy. It's got to be there or you will be separated from those that you're trying to affect and save. All right? Chapter 25, page 275. Everybody with me? Yes. Okay. Go sho chi chu fu shi shin kin sho ro Yaku, Shikiko, Guko, Sokubin, Bukushi, Byojin, Joyu, Yoji, Shishin, Ja, Kingo, Burai, Zui, Yakangi, Monjin, Gu, Shaku, Jibyo, Ninyo, Go, Yaku, Nifu, Kobuku, Shoi, Shaga, Doku, Jinyo, Shippon, Shinko, Oshi, Ko, Shikiko, Yaku, Ni, Ifu, Mi. The Romaji reads, uh, translates as, those children who have not lost their senses can see that this is good medicine, outstanding in both color and fragrance, so they take it immediately and are completely uh, cured of their sickness. And everybody remembers yeah. the first part from last week, right? Those who are out of their minds are equally delighted to see their father return and beg him to cure their sickness. But when they are given the medicine, they refuse to take it. 
Why? Because the poison has penetrated deeply and their minds no longer function as before. So although the medicine is of excellent color and fragrance, they do not perceive it as good. So when we shakabuku people that are looking for something to help change their lives, and they ultimately then reject, reject the law, even though they've been introduced to it, even though they've been given that opportunity, they don't see what we see. They don't feel what we feel. Mm -hmm. They don't persevere in the manner that we persevere. We are the ones that perceive it for what it is and take the medicine. They are the ones, though they seek it, that reject it because the poison has penetrated deeply. Do you understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. So he says, everyone wants to be ha become happy and get along with others. No one starts out wanting to be miserable or to live with others in a state of mutual hatred and contempt. And I think that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. In reality, however, we find people living under such conditions. Often people tumble down the slope of misfortune due to errors in judgment that result from their preoccupation with trivi trivialities. They may come into conflict or even start wars with one another over issues that, in the larger schemes of thing, things, are truly insignificant. Nietzsche says, fish want to survive. They deplore their pond's shallowness and dig holes in the bottom to hide in. Yet tricked by the bait, they take the hook. Birds in a tree fear that they are too low and perch in the top branches, yet bewitched by bait, they too are caught in snares. Although in their hearts people desperately seek happiness, at crucial junctures they in fact move in the opposite direction. The, like, like if you're practicing going titan, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I keep thinking of the person that you were talking about last week. I've thought about him a lot. The sick children in the above passage represent people who dis with distorted lives and foolish minds who are unable to judge things correctly. Mm. The Buddha uses the light of wisdom to guide distorted lives in the correct direction, the, direct, the direction of happiness. This is the lesson of the parable of the skilled physician and his sick children. True mind means the mind of belief in the mystic law. Among the children who drank poison, some have not yet lost their minds, or more literally, their true or original minds. Do you understand what he's saying there? What's our true or original mind? the mind of the Buddha, mm -hmm. of our original state, our true identity, all right? These children, perceiving the medicine prepared by their father to be excellent in color and fragrance, drink it without hesitation. Their sickness is immediately cured. Nietzsche says true mind means the mind that believes in the Lotus Sutra. And he speaks of the true mind of the Buddha nature. True mind is nothing other than the Buddha nature, okay? People, even while laboring under various illusions, can believe, that the Lod believe in the Lotus Sutra precisely because they possess the Buddha nature in the depths of their lives. That's the reason we can be the Buddha, because the Buddha is already there. Yeah. It's not something that we have to go find, actually. Mm -hmm. It's something we uncover. The parable then goes on to explain about the children who have lost their minds. They too rejoice upon seeing their father return and beseech him to cure them. But when the essential medicine is given to them, they cannot bring themselves to drink it. It's their karma. That is because the person, the poison has penetrated them deeply and they are no longer lucid. Everybody knows what lucid means, right? They, can, they still have their senses about them, right? They are no longer lucid, which means they no longer have their senses about them. In other words, deep-seated illusions prevent the power of the Buddha nature from emerging, like holding the gohans responsible for your problems or the result, temporary as any result is, mm -hmm. as being something you know, permanent or something that reflects a lack of power. Do you understand? You can never know the true power if you're only going to gauge it on this low level. You have to have great obstacles to reveal great power. All right? Yes. In other words, deep-seated illusions prevent the power of the Buddha nature from emerging. Although such people seek happiness, and although the fundamental cause for becoming happy is right there before their eyes, they fail to realize it. Mm -hmm. Unable to recognize the medicine of excellent color and fragrance for what it is, they suspect that it is bad. 
Not only do they fail to believe in the mystic law, they actively reject it. They suffer from delusion to the extent that they cannot distinguish between good and bad, true and false. Nietzsche says, the words the poison has penetrated deeply refer to persons who have become deeply committed to the provisional teachings, an action that constitutes slander of the law. For that reason, they do not believe or accept the highly effective medicine of the Lotus Sutra, which is Nam Myoho Rengekyo. Okay? Deeply committed to the provisional teachings indicates the distorted judgment and attitude of those who criticize superior teachings out of attachment to inferior teachings. Do you understand what he just said there? He just now brought this from just Buddhism and provisional versus essential to all teachings in all philosophies, all solutions. I'll read it again. Deeply committed to the provisional teachings doesn't just talk, it's just not referring just to provisional teachings of Buddhism. Deeply committed to the provisional teachings indicates the distorted judgment and attitude of those who criticize superior teachings out of attachment to inferior teachings. Do you understand? So if you criticize the Buddhism of the sowing out of attachment to anything, mm -hmm. there is no superior teaching to the teaching of nam myoho mm -hmm. All right? So, but because of their attachment to inferior teachings, they reject the superior teaching. Do you understand what he's saying? This is, again, all karma. Yes. Deeply commit, oh, pardon me. Broadly speaking, this might be said to describe the attitude of those who forget the spirit of self-improvement <clears throat> and advancement. What is he talking about there? The deadlock of the present age is due to people having forgotten their inner revolution. Broadly speaking, this might be said to describe the attitude of those who forget the spirit of self-improvement and advancement. Mm. What is the spirit of self-improvement and advancement? Seeking Buddhahood. Mm. Okay, he's not talking about trying to be smarter or speak more languages mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, be more attractive, right? <laughs> Uh, such people instead become attached to a shallow way of life and moreover criticize those who earnestly uh, and with a, uh, who live earnestly and with a lofty spirit. People become comfortable with being rich, with having what they consider to be a problem-free life, and they laugh or, or kind of smirk at people that are sincerely trying to encourage others, that are devoted to that process rather than enjoying the fruits of being rich or whatever it is that's pacifying them. Mm -hmm. That's kept them from, again, this process of self-improvement, this correct way of life. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. Such people in instead become attached to a shallow way of life and moreover criticize those who live earnestly and with a lofty spirit. Regarding the parable of the skilled physician and his sick children, President Tota said, when we first read these passages, they seem to describe Shakyamuni's time. But when we examine them carefully, we find that they are prophecies. They are prophetic words pointing to this age of the latter day of the law. Mm -hmm. This sutra passage certainly sheds light on the absurd conditions of society, of society today. Although people seek care, ultimately they refuse to drink the medicine. In the depths of their hearts, all people desire to live in earnest, but the power of good in the human spirit that of dedication, courage, benevolence, and wisdom has grown weak. That's because society lacks a firm philosophy or set of ideals. As a result, people's sense of values is unstable. They confuse good and evil, truth and falsehood, selflessness and selfishness, and the lofty and pardon me, the lofty and the base. Do you understand what he's saying there? Society lacks a firm philosophy or set of ideals. Mm. All right? There is no philosophy that's prevalent that says worry about other people and make them equal to yourself. Okay? It's always about me and my creator, me and my higher power, me and something vertical to me. It's not horizontal. It's not the broad, uh, you know, Buddhism of equality of, of, of the Buddhism of the sowing. It's always about me. It's, it's, it's selfish. That's what he's just saying there. Mm -hmm. uh, they confuse good and evil. 
truth and falsehood, selfish, selflessness and selfishness, the lofty and the base. Everybody's with me? Yes. Mm-hmm. Buddhism characterizes the illusion that pleasurable circumstances can continue indefinitely as the four inverted views. This describes the mistaken <coughs> views of the qualities of eternity, happening, happiness, true self, and purity held by someone who lives only for the pursuit of pleasure or worldly gain, okay, or themselves. This shallow outlook stems from the assumption that such momentary pleasures as money and worldly fame will continue forever, that they are pleasurable, that pursuing them is being true to oneself and achieving them a wonderful thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that as long as it's perceived from the correct perspective. But when it becomes an end in and of itself, it will always lead eventually to the effect of that cause. Selfishness does not gain any reward that's lasting. For the sake of those caught up in such thinking, Shakyamuni first expounded the principles of impermanence, suffering, non-self, and non-substantiality. Does everybody understand that? Impermanence, suffering, non-self, and substantiality. What are those? Do you know what those are? Those are the flip side of the same coin of eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. All right? Mm -hmm. For the sake of those caught up in such thinking, Shakyamuni first expounded the principle of impermanent suffering, non-self, and non-substantiality and severely criticized attachment to pleasure. Right? We had the, that's what the precepts were all, all about. Don't do this, don't do that, don't mm. do this, don't do that, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. After he had raised the state of life, their life condition of these people through such expedient teachings, expedient teachings, he expounded the Lotus Sutra, which finally revealed the true aspect of the indestructible values of eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. Those other four were the, delu- the, the delusional flips of those four higher uh, per, uh, 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 virtues. To illustrate, let us consider happiness. The happiness of the four inverted views may be expressed as, if I'm happy now, nothing else matters. Such a sentiment can produce no vital force or true brilliance in one's life. But the happiness that may be gained by carrying out activities for Kosa Rufu comprises true comfort and joy that wells forth from the very depths of one's being and can make you start to cry for no reason. Out of happiness. <laughs> it is happiness of a completely different kind. And that is the case. Con- constantly going out to offer people encouragement, thinking, I wonder how that person is doing. Or is that person in high spirits is certainly a laborious undertaking. It's not easy. But in the course of such continual dialogue, we see smiles return to the faces of friends formerly mired in suffering. And we see people overcome the turbulent waves of destiny that, became, that become revitalized. And what do we experience in that process? Great joy. Great joy. Because their victories become our victories. Mm-hmm. That's really where we're, that's, we're not jealous of that. We're not <coughs> like, well, why don't I get that? Okay? That's not what happens when you aspire to live this way. You actually become very happy seeing other people become happy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. The joy and sense of reward we feel at such times far surpasses what we, what we might experience from watching a great drama. This is a way of life genuinely based on eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. This is the correct way to live your life. With pride as SGI members, let us lead lives richly imbued with the virtues of eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. Let us create in our environments a fresh brilliance of life and a correct sense of values. Let us dauntlessly spread the philosophy of the dignity of life and let us carry out the actions of bodhisattvas. The path to transforming a society of distorted values lies in carrying out such efforts. Now, what is the action, the actions of bodhisattvas? 
compassion. 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 The desire to see other people overcome mm -hmm. their problems and mm -hmm. to be able to achieve the same state that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. All right? Without lamenting their level of success mm -hmm. or comparing them to us. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, chapter 26. We may go farther. Where, how are we doing on time? We're 836. We've got plenty of time. Okay, I may end up reading things I haven't read yet. 26, <clears throat> page, uh, pardon me, 281, right? Yeah. Buza ze nin shi shi kamin i doka shochu shi shin kai tin do suikin ga ki kin shaku ryo nyo ze yaku ni fu ko buku ga kin to setsu ho bin ro buku shi yaku soko sa ze ga nyo to to chi ga ga kon sui ro shi ji i shi ze ro rak ze ze ko ro yaku kan ru zai shi nyo ka shu buku motsu fu zai the father thinks to himself my poor children, because of the poison in them, their minds are completely befuddled. Although they are happy to see me and ask me to cure them, they refuse to take this excellent medicine. I must now resort to some expedient means to induce them to take the medicine. So he says to them, You should know that I am now old and worn out, and the time of my death has, and the, and the time of my death has come. I will leave this good medicine here, you should take it and not worry that it will not cure you. You should not worry that it will not cure you. Seeing the children who adamantly refuse to drink the medicine, the father thinks, my poor children. These words are tremendously moving. They convey the immense mercy of the Buddha who seeks to lead everyone without exception to happiness not the ones that deserve it and the, versus the ones that don't deserve it. Do you understand? Still, the father does not attempt to force the children to drink the medicine. Did you hear that? Still, the father does not attempt to force the children to drink the medicine. Why does he not try to force them to drink the medicine? If he has such compassion, he's their dad, why didn't he just say, drink it? They can't, be concured, they can't be cured that way. They have to do, have the desire to seek. It's the karmic impediment of their own life that's keeping them from seeing it and having the correct color and fragrance. Okay, That's why he can't force them. He has to use an expedient means to induce them, to make them want to take it. They say, oh, he's gone. Oh, dad, don't, you know. You know the rest of the story, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the whole point. Hmm. Compulsion cannot change the distortions lurking in the depths of people's hearts. That's why teachings that predicate on hell and fear or reward and heaven never actually really work in the broad, broad sense of things. Because you can talk about hell until hell freezes over and people still do bad things. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they in that moment can't perceive what hell might be. They don't listen to this teaching of hell. They may even say they believe in the teaching of hell and heaven. But they don't reflect that in their actions. Mm. Right? Because it's compulsive. It's not something that they're inspired, a teaching that they know with their life. It's a teaching that they've been given as a point of retribution if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Compulsion cannot change the distortions lurking in the depths of people's hearts. It is important that people take up the medicine and drink it of their own accord. They must change their karma. Only by doing so can you say that you have the perception to see your life clearly and without distortion. Out of, this, out of his compassionate concern for the children, and his desire for them to display true self-motivation, true self-motivation, true self-motivation. Mm -hmm. The father, rather than compel them, uses his wisdom to get them to take the medicine of their own accord. Mm -hmm. 
How can I prompt them to decide to drink the medicine, he wonders. I'll use an expedient means to cause them to drink it. As an expedient, he chooses to announce that he will soon die. The father tells them, I have grown old and weak, and it appears that I will soon die. I will leave the medicine here for you to drink. You need not worry that your sufferings will not be cured. If they, uh, for they will be cured without fail. For they will be cured without fail. Mm -hmm. He then sets out and sends someone back to announce that he has died. That's basically what I just read here. The father has not actually died. He merely causes the children to think that he has. In this way, he seeks to purge them of their tendency to depend on him. And in doing so, dispel their, uh, dispels their delusions. An expedient means, as I have said many times, is an expression of the Buddha's compassion. If the Buddha were always present in the world, people would become dependent. If the mentor was always in the world, people that are the disciple would never become the mentor. Mm. Under such circumstances, the Buddha could not attain the objective of raising people to the same state of life as his own. Do you understand? Because there's no, there's no Buddha that's a disciple. When you become the Buddha, you become a mentor. Do you understand? Mm. That's the goal, is for you to become a teacher of the law. All right? So the Buddha arouses immense compassion and as the ultimate expedient means, appears to enter extinction. On one level, I leave this good medicine here for you now, refers to Shakyamuni leaving the Lotus Sutra for those in the world after his death. What is the meaning hidden in the depths of this passage? What does he mean there? How does this relate to the Buddhism of the sowing? Every time he's, he says hidden in the depths, we're not talking about the Lotus Sutra. We're talking about the Lotus Sutra, but we're talking about the meaning hidden in the depths. The meaning hidden in the depths is only revealed in the Buddhism of the sowing. It is not revealed in the Buddhism, Buddhism of the harvest. Do you understand? Yes. All right, so he says, so the, um, where am I? Uh, he, pardon me. Last paragraph. Last paragraph, mm -hmm. okay. What is the meaning of hidden in the depths of this passage? Pardon me. Nietzsche says, I will leave this, indicates that it is for the latter day of the law. Here means the country of Japan and the continent of Jampadvipa. He characterizes Japan as a country filled with persons of incorrigible disbelief. That first part was a quotation from the OTT. The Daishonin appeared in a land of people of incorrigible disbelief. And he left behind the great law of nam myoho renge for the people of the latter day. Regarding the passage, you should take it and not worry that it will not cure you. Nichiren says that you indicates all people of the latter day. And take means embracing and chanting nam myoho renge -kyo. He says, from the time we swallow it, we become eternally endowed with the three bodies. What does that mean? What does that refer to again? that I've, I've gotten up and gone and gotten the OTT and it's chapter 15. Do you want me to say it again? Do you know which one I'm talking about? He says, from the time we swallow it, we become eternally endowed with the three bodies. From the time we invoke nam myoho renge -kyo in our life, we validate our relationship with the law. We are Buddhas, not in theory. Mm -hmm. All right? And what does that mean? That means that arising within us the three bodies of which we are internally endowed become revealed. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? That's what makes us Buddhists. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, from the time we swallow it, we become eternally endowed with the three bodies. So this again creates, there is no differentiation of I've been a bodhisattva every lifetime or I'm a bodhisattva for the first time. Bodhisattva of the earth is a bodhisattva of the earth. It's revealed by the bodhisattva of the earth's actions. What occurred in the past doesn't matter. What occurs in this moment is what matters. Mm -hmm. That is what will be reflected in the future eternally. Do you understand? So there's not good, old, more established bodhisattvas of the earth and young, inexperienced, minors mm -hmm. bodhisattvas of the earth. Do you understand? Yes. There are only bodhisattvas of the earth. That's what he's qualifying there. Mm. There's no greater and lesser when it comes to bodhisattvas of the earth. Mm. Or Buddhas for that matter. 
Thus we are cured of the sickness of attachment to the Buddha who first attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. The harvest, the Buddhism of the harvest. And we embrace and reveal the Buddhism of the sowing in our own life. The sickness of attachment to the Buddha who first attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree reminds us that as long as we suppose there is a separation between the Buddha and other people, as there is in the Buddhism of the harvest, because all those people are going to become Buddhas, aren't they? That's what Shakyamuni prophesizes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say you're already the Buddha exactly mm -hmm. as you are. He says, oh, someday you're going to be sun, moon, bright, you know, 50 watt, or you're going to be sun, moon, bright, 100 watt, whatever, okay? There is no separation between the Buddha and other people. We recognize, we can, pardon me, the sickness of, attach, of attachment to the Buddha who first attained enlightenment under the Bodhi, Bodhi tree reminds us that as long as we suppose there is a separation be, between the Buddha and other people, we cannot recognize the tremendous life that exists within us right now, this moment, this moment, this moment, not when we get to it, not when we perfect ourselves, not when we change in some way. The mystic law is the great teaching that enables all of us to realize that we are originally Buddhas. When the immense life of the Buddha manifests within our being, all our sufferings disappear like dew in the morning rays of the sun because there is no more suffering, because there's nothing we experience that we don't kick ass on. There are no more obstacles. There are no more trials and tribulations that we don't experience victory in overcoming. Right, Catherine? Yeah. The mystic law is the great teaching that enables all of us to realize that we are originally Buddhas. When the immense life of the Buddha manifests within our being, all of our sufferings disappear like the dew in the morning rays of the sun. When that happens, we are in the state in which we will not worry that, we will, that it will not cure. When that happens, we, will, we are in the state in which we will not worry that it will not cure us. We need not worry about anything. We will definitely become happy. This is what the Buddha declares. Okay? On yeah. to chapter 27, which I haven't gotten to yet because I didn't think we'd go this fast. I guess I'm not talking as much out of text as I usually do. So on page 285, let's continue with chapter 27. <clears throat> Koku shi ken shi gengo nyobu ishi zeji shoshi mombu haiso shindai uno ni sa zenen yakubu zaisha jimin gato no kin kugo konjo shaga o on to on so to kaku koku ji yui koro mubu jiko jo i hiken Shin Zui Shogo Nai Chi Shi Yako Shiki Ko Mimi Sokoshu Bukushi Dokubio Kayu Gobu Manshi Shi Chi Tokusai Jin Bin Rai Ki Genshi Ken Shi. Having given these instructions, he then goes off to another land where he sends a messenger home to announce, Your father is dead. At that time, the children hearing that their father has deserted them and died, are filled with great grief and consternation and think to themselves, if our father were, were alive, he would have pity on us and see that we are protected. Now, But now he has abandoned us and died in some other country far away. We are shelterless orphans with no one to rely on. Constantly harboring such feelings of grief, they at last come to their senses and realize that the medicine is in fact excellent in color and fragrance and flavor. And so they take it and are healed of all the effects of the poison. The father, hearing that his children are all cured, immediately returns home and appears to them once more, saying, I was just joking, folks. <laughs> <laughs> what will become of things after I am gone? This is the constant thought of a genuine leader. That a leader should attend to the present goes without saying. But, is, but it is constantly thinking about the future and setting the stage for future generations that distinguish an outstanding leader. This may be harsh, 
but leaders concerned only with their own age are egoists. Let me read that one again from Daisaku Ikeda. This may be harsh, but it's the truth, so I got to tell it to you, he says. This may be harsh, but leaders concerned only with their own age are egoists because they're not concerned about Kosen Rufu because Kosen Rufu hasn't happened yet. So if you're only concerned about now rather than Kosen Rufu, then you're not concerned with the right things. Hmm. Society and people and the people who come in the wake of such leaders will suffer. Will suffer. That's when organizational numbers go down. That's when all kinds of things hit the fan. Hmm. This is an essential leadership principle, and it holds true in all areas. So I encourage you, take that to heart and remember it for the rest of your life as bodhisattvas of the earth. Moreover, the Buddha is a great leader among leaders who has stood up for the eternal happiness of all beings. How can I save people after my passing? This is the Buddha's greatest concern. Therein lies his true mission and his will for the future. The statement he sends a messenger home to announce and other statements in this passage clarify this point. The skilled physician, after preparing the effective medicine and setting out on a journey, sends home a messenger who announces to the children that their father has died in the course of his travels. The children are thunderstruck, filled with grief. They finally open their eyes and realize that the effective medicine their father left behind is in fact excellent in color and fragrance and flavor, and they take it. As a result, they are completely cured of their sickness. They become Buddhas. The important point here is that the father induces the children to take the, me the effective medicine by concealing himself. As long as he remained at their side, the children refused to take the medicine and simply sank deeper into suffering. Under these circumstances, the father used the expedient means of having someone inform the children that he had died in another land. He could thus finally cause his beloved children to take the medicine and so lead them to happiness. Okay? I had a good friend refer to me as an ATM of Buddhist wisdom. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that they could just ask any questions you because they knew they'd get the right answer. Okay? My purpose is not to be an ATM of Buddhism. My purpose <laughs> is to inspire you mm -hmm. to read as I have read, to understand as I have understood, and to chant the same kind of Daimoku that I have chanted. If you think that I am an ATM without Daimoku, if you think the ATM became an ATM <laughs> from just reading, you're kidding yourself. Okay, and that's not the purpose of me talking to you. Do you understand? Yes. That's what President Akeda is talking about here. Mm. You know, people just relying on, ah, oh, President Akeda, boy, he knows all the shit. Just read his stuff and you don't have to worry about reading anything else. You don't have to understand anything else. Mm. Oh, we got a question. Let's go ask our leaders. <laughs> this is not the purpose of Buddhism. No. The purpose of Buddhism is to grow as a human being, to grow your life in a way that inspires others to grow their lives. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So... Under these circumstances, the father used the expedient means of having someone inform the children that he had died in another land. He could thus finally cause his beloved children to take the medicine and so lead them to happiness. The skilled physician, needless to say, is Shakyamuni himself and the children of the people in the world after Shakyamuni's passing. The children's grief upon hearing the sad news of their father's death, we are shelterless orphans with no one to rely on, is the heartfelt cry of people who have lost the Buddha. It could also be said to represent the cry of people today whose lives, cut off from the cool, fresh waters of a reliable philosophy, have become parched and dry. What then is the effective medicine? It is the teaching left behind by the Buddha. It is the law. According to Tintai, highly effective medicine means the sutras and teachings of the Buddha. In summation, the parable of the skilled physician and his sick children indicates how the Buddha, the skilled physician, uses the expedient means of his death to enable the people in the world, after his passing, the children, to believe in the teaching, the effective medicine he has left behind. This is a restatement of the principal theme of the entire lifespan <coughs> chapter. This is a restatement of the principal theme of the entire lifespan chapter. Why? Because what has the father actually 
endeavored to accomplish and then ultimately accomplished? Was it to get his sick children well? Was it about some sort of illness that they had? And No, make them equal to himself. Yes. He has made them Buddhas as well. Yes. Do you understand? Yes. All right. The passage he sends a messenger home to announce begs the question, just who exactly is the messenger sent by the skilled <coughs> physician? Now, I never asked myself that question, but I suppose he's going to give us an answer now. The messenger communicates the news of the father's death to the children. Entrusted with the father's spirit to somehow lead the children to happiness, the messenger fulfills a vital role in enabling them to take the, mes the, the medicine. Do you understand? What did I just say then? I love it when you guys go like this when I say, do you understand? And then I ask a question and nobody says anything. What? Okay, what's he talking about there? I'm going to read that paragraph again. Because President Kate, I now understand why, again, I hadn't read this. You see, there's no yellow there. So now I understand what President Kate's point is completely. Let me read it again. The passage he sends a messenger home to announce begs the question, just who exactly is the messenger <coughs> sent by the skilled physician? The messenger communicates the news of the father's death to the children. Entrusted mm -hmm. with the father's spirit to somehow lead the children to happiness, the messenger fulfills a vital role in enabling them to take the medicine. Mm -hmm. Because if it weren't for the messenger, they would have never gotten the news that their father had perished. They would never have been motivated themselves to accept and to take the medicine. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. So the messenger is just as important as the father himself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. So when we are taking, who is the father in reality? Is it Shakyamuni? Is it the father in a story? The father is the thus come one nam myoho Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. The nam myoho Rengekyo, thus come one, the original teacher. Who are the messengers? Who is the messenger that delivers that tries to inspire the children to take the poor medicine that have not had the lucid clarity Nichiren. to take it of their own accord. Nichiren. The Nichiren. bodhisattvas Nichiren. of the Nichiren. earth. No, Nichiren's the eternal Buddha. Yeah. The messengers are us. The children that Nichiren. haven't taken the medicine, the point that mm. had drunk the poison, are out of their mind. Or everybody, we're yeah. trying to re shakabuku. Do you understand? Yes. yes. All right. I assume that's what he's going to say here. Again, yeah. I haven't read this. The messenger communicates the news of the father's death to the children and just entrusted with the father's spirit to somehow lead the children to happiness. Now, that doesn't that sound with us? We're entrusted with the father's spirit. We're entrusted with the Daishonin spirit to deliver the medicine. Do you understand? Yes. The messenger fulfills a vital role in enabling uh, them to take the medicine. Perhaps without this messenger, the children would have died from the illness. Mm -hmm. In fact, the messenger represents people with the most important mission in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. The messenger sent home to announce represents those who can communicate the correct Buddhist teachings to people after the Buddha's passing. Mm -hmm. We're the messenger. The Daishonin's yeah. gone. He died in the 13th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. It indicates the thus come one's messengers mm -hmm. who can spread Buddhism hope, Buddhism's hopeful teaching in an age bereft of hope. Regardless, this, uh, regarding this point, Nietzsche clearly states, when the sutra says he sends a messenger home to announce, it, it refers to the bodhisattvas of the earth. Yes. I was correct. <laughs> the bodhisattvas of the earth who will shoulder the task of propagating propagation after Shakyamuni's death that these bodhisattvas will gallantly appear in the evil world of the latter day when Shakyamuni's teaching has lost its power and lead people to enlightenment and spread the effective medicine of the mystic law that the Buddha left behind. This indeed is a message of hope. Hmm. On one level, Nietzsche struggled to spread the mystic law as bodhisattva superior practices. Leader of the bodhisattvas of the earth. Do you understand what he, where he's going with this? He says, on one level, okay? Leader of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, on the level of the Lotus Sutra's implicit meaning, on the level of the uh, Lotus Sutra, of the Buddhism of the sowing, mm -hmm. all right? He is the original Buddha who left behind the great effective medicine of Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. 
this whole parable from the Lotus Sutra where Shakyamuni is talking about, he's talking about Nietzsche and talking about the Bodhisattvas of the earth and talking about the people suffering in the latter day of the law. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, which can lead all people uh, throughout the latter day to enlightenment. The Daishon in his, him, is himself the skilled physician of, and the father of all people. Accordingly, from this standpoint, the messenger is none other than those who advance Kosen Rufu in strict accordance with the Daishonin's teachings. I will say that again because that's the imperative. That's what makes it so. Okay? It's not just talking about Nam Yaho Rengekyo. It's talking about the correct perception of Nam Yaho Rengekyo mm -hmm. and how it applies to each person equally. On Accordingly, from this standpoint, the messenger is none other than those who advance Kosen Rufu in strict accord with the Daishonin's teachings. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand the teachings before you can um, advance Kosen Rufu in strict accord with them. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That's why we're sitting here. Mm -hmm. On one level, as Bodhisattvas of the earth, and on another, as followers of the original Buddha, we are emissaries of the Thus Come One, who tell others about the supreme teaching of the mystic law and show actual proof of its greatness. This is the honorable status we all enjoy. This is the correct way to live our lives. This is the correct way for everyone to live their life. Never before in the history of Buddhism has there been a popular movement like ours that has spread the correct Buddhist teaching to such an extent or led so many people to happiness more than anything else, this reality, this role we have played, attests to the fact that we are the noble emissaries of the Buddha. Nichiren calls out to his disciples, Now at the beginning of the latter day of the law, I, Nichiren, am the first to embark on propagating throughout Jampo Vipa the five characters of Myoho Rengeko, which are the heart of the Lotus Sutra and the eye of all Buddhas. And you understand every time you ever read the five characters of Myoho Rengekyo, that also can, is read exactly the same as five or seven characters, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Of Nam Myoho Rengekyo. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, my disciples, form your ranks and follow me and surpass even Mahakashayapa and, uh, or Ananda, Tiantai or Dingyo. I have opened the way to world coast and roof, Nichiren says. My disciples, follow me and accomplish a great mission. As messengers sent to announce... Our mission is to carry out the original Buddhist spirit and spread the mystic law throughout the entire world. Even the skilled physician could not have saved his children without a messenger. Without us. Yeah, there we go. Even the skilled <coughs> physician could not have saved his children without a messenger because he's not going to stick around in this world mm. forever. Mm. No Buddha can. No Buddha will. Every Buddha is born into the nine worlds. Mm. Right? They will have a temporary, uh, they will have a point of death. <laughs> similarly, without, similarly, without the popular movement of bodhisattvas of the earth who embrace the great effective medicine of the mystic law, the people of the ailing present age cannot be saved. Together, let us proudly advance along the glorious path of life of, the, of, life, of bodhisattvas of the earth. And I'm going to stop there so I don't go any further than Anik. So we'll start next week, no matter what time it is now, with chapter 28 on page 290, or 291. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.